Welcome back to the Easy Med channel where medical topics are made easy. Today we're going to be talking about appendicitis. The appendix is a tubular structure that's located in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen at the junction of the small intestine and large intestine. The appendix comes off of the cecum, which is that pouch-like structure at the beginning of the large intestine. On average, the appendix is about 9 centimeters long. The appendix is also referred to as the vermiform process. Vermiform means worm-shaped, and that describes that tubular worm-like structure of the appendix. The function of the appendix is overall unknown, but there are a couple different ideas. The first one is that it's a reservoir for gut bacteria. So when we're experiencing a GI illness and we're suffering from diarrhea, some of that good bacteria in the intestine goes into the appendix and it helps to maintain that good gut flora. The second idea is that the appendix is involved in the lymphatic and immune system. Let's now take a closer look at the appendix. We can see that tubular worm-like structure coming off of the cecum where the small intestine and large intestine join. Unfortunately, the structure can become inflamed or infected, and this is known as appendicitis. Appendicitis is when you get inflammation of the appendix. Appendicitis can happen at any age, but it's more prevalent between the ages of 10 and 30, and it's one of the most common causes of abdominal surgery. So what causes appendicitis? Typically, appendicitis is caused by some kind of obstruction, and we're going to talk about those downstream effects here in a second. The most common type of obstruction is a fecalate. This is a piece of stool that gets stuck in the appendix. Another cause of obstruction is lymphoid hyperplasia. The appendix contains lymphoid follicles, which are dense collections of lymphocytes. During adolescence, the lymphoid follicles can grow in size, and this growth can sometimes obstruct the appendix, which can lead to appendicitis. The lymphoid follicles can also grow in size whenever we're fighting off infection involving the intestines. So if we're dealing with a viral or bacterial infection of the gut, then the lymphoid follicles of the appendix can grow in size, and they potentially can obstruct the appendix, and this too can lead to appendicitis. So the overall concept is that appendicitis is caused by some kind of obstruction. Now what happens after an obstruction is present? Well, you're going to have increased mucus and bacteria within the appendix. The bacteria are going to multiply and that mucus is going to build up. And they have nowhere to go because they're blocked. And this is going to increase the pressure within the appendix. The increased pressure is going to make the appendix angry and lead to inflammation. The increased inflammation will compromise blood flow to and from the appendix. We're going to have decreased arterial blood flow to the appendix and increased venous congestion leaving the appendix, and this is going to lead to ischemia. As the appendix becomes more ischemic, the cells that make up the wall of the appendix are going to die off, and this is going to make the appendix wall thin. And as that wall gets thinner and thinner, it could lead to perforation of the appendix, which is when the appendix bursts or ruptures. If an appendix perforates, then its content can spill out into the abdominal cavity and lead to abscess formation. It may also cause peritonitis, which is inflammation within the abdominal wall cavity, and it may even lead to sepsis, which is worsening infection that can get into the bloodstream. Now that we know what causes appendicitis and how it happens, let's talk about some of the symptoms. Typically, there's going to be abdominal pain. At first, the abdominal pain may be generalized or periumbilical, which is pain around the belly button. Over time, this pain can migrate and localize to the right lower quadrant, which is the location of the appendix. And the reason for this is the pain starts off visceral, then it becomes parietal pain, especially as that appendix is getting more inflamed. There may also be associated nausea and vomiting, and there may be a fever present. As mentioned before, the pain is usually in the right lower quadrant where the appendix is located. McBurney's point corresponds with the typical location of the appendix. If you draw a line between the belly button and the anterior superior iliac crest, which is the top front part of the hip bone or pelvic bone, you're going to find McBurney's point about one-third the distance from the anterior superior iliac crest. McBurney's point correlates with the typical location of the appendix. So when appendicitis is present, there's usually right lower quadrant pain in that area. There's a few other physical exam findings that can be present. The first one is the Robsing sign. This is when palpation to the left lower quadrant worsens right lower quadrant pain. The psoas sign is when the patient lays on their left side and the right leg is extended at the hip, and this elicits abdominal pain. The obturator sign is when the right leg is internally and externally rotated, and this too elicits abdominal pain. Now, how do we diagnose appendicitis? Typically, blood work and some type of imaging is performed. On the blood test, you might see an elevated white blood cell count due to the inflammation and or infection that's present. However, a normal white blood cell count does not rule out appendicitis. In terms of imaging, there are a few different modalities. The first one is ultrasound, which is usually the imaging of choice for pediatric patients and pregnant women. You can also see appendicitis on CT abdomen and pelvis. This can be used on males or non-pregnant females. You can also pick up appendicitis on MRI imaging. This might be necessary when unable to identify appendicitis in pediatric patients or pregnant females on ultrasound, 
or maybe ultrasound isn't available and you don't want to risk radiating the patient using a CT scan, then you may resort to an MRI at that time as well. There are a few different potential complications to appendicitis. First, the appendix can rupture or burst called perforation, and the content within the appendix can leak into the abdominal cavity. This can lead to abscess formation, and it can also lead to peritonitis, which is inflammation of the peritoneum. Let's wrap this up by talking about the treatment for appendicitis. In the majority of cases, the appendix is going to be surgically removed, known as appendectomy. You're also going to want to control the patient's pain and any other symptoms that might be present, including nausea and vomiting. You're going to want to keep the patient MPO, which is nothing to eat or drink by mouth, so that way they're prepared surgically. The patient might also be receiving IV fluids. Lastly, in conjunction with the surgical consultation, you might be considering antibiotics. Hopefully this was a good summary for everyone. Real quick before you go, please hit that like button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already so that way you don't miss out on future videos that make medicine easy. I'm going to link down below in the description the EasyMed blog that correlates with this appendicitis video. Thanks for watching and I hope you check out future topics.